17, so it's in the Old Testament, right, right about in the middle of your Bible. And uh, the second one is going to be from Romans, which is in the New Testament, so it's near the end. If you didn't bring a Bible, that's fine. We, we'll put it on the screen behind me anyways here. So, uh, From Psalm 17. O Lord, hear my plea for justice. Listen to my cry for help. Pay attention to my prayer, for it comes from honest lips. Declare me innocent, for you see those who do right. You have tested my thoughts and examined my heart in the night. You have scrutinized me and found nothing wrong. I am determined not to sin in what I say. I have followed your commands, which keep me from following cruel and evil people. My steps have stayed on your path. I have not wavered from following you. I am praying to you because I know you will answer, O oh God. Bend down and listen as I pray. Show me your unfailing love in wonderful ways. By your mighty power, you rescue those who seek refuge from their enemies. Because I am righteous, I will see you. When I awake, I will see you face to face and be satisfied. And from Romans chapter 9, Paul writes, With Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. They are the people of Israel, chosen to be God's adopted children. God revealed his glory to them. He made covenants with them and gave them his law. He gave them the privilege of worshiping him and receiving his wonderful promises. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are their ancestors, and Christ himself was an Israelite as far as his human nature is concerned. And he is God, the one who rules over everything and is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. This is God's word for us today. Thanks be to God. So I, I keep getting these, um, these phone calls from these video production companies that want me to do a trial version of their curriculum. You know, these, these, these companies have been around for a long time, like, you know, 20, 30 years or so, maybe even longer. And, and they, they make these videos, these Bible study curriculums and these videos that you can show to groups or, or to people and, and to, to teach them. Um, and they're good. The videos are good. But they're, they're often very, very expensive. And so when these companies call me and want me to do this, I always tell them, I say, enjoy the videos much, but we can't afford them. And so they thank me politely for my time, and then we hang up. And then they call back a month later to try again. And I'm like, yeah. so I go through the whole spiel again. I like the videos, but they're too expensive. Can't afford them. Thank you anyway. They thank me for my time. We hang up. Inevitably, they call back. I mean, it might be a month or two months later, maybe three months later, but they always call. They keep calling. They keep on calling. I mean, these guys, these guys either forget that they've called me like 5,000 times already, or else they think that they can wear me down. Well, keep trying, boys. <laughs> keep trying. I'm your huckleberry. <laughs> you know, other businesses do this. They do. Other businesses do this. Um, one, of the, one of the rules of telemarketing has got to be persistence, right? Because insurance companies do this, and, and banks do this, and siding companies do this, and even, um, even some churches do this, right? When they, they have a hard time taking no for an answer. You know what? I, I, I guess sometimes people have this philosophy, or those businesses have this philosophy that, that they want to try to break your resolve, or they want to try to just wear you down to the point where, where you'll say yes. And they're so persistent that sometimes that backfires. You know, sometimes these companies are so, they be, they're so in our face, bless you, they're so in our face that we, we just push them away and we don't want to have anything to do with them. And so sometimes it doesn't work, but sometimes being persistent does work, doesn't it? Sometimes it works. Have you ever, have you ever had someone be real persistent with you and want, want you to try something and so they keep at you and keep at you and then you finally try it and you find out that it's awesome? Has that happened to you before? You know, on Wednesday nights, um, on, during, uh, after our Bible study, we have Bible study on Wednesdays, and then we go out afterwards to uh, Westgate and we get some food. Good time. Anybody who doesn't come to that on Wednesdays and you're available, we'd love to have you. We have, we have a lot of fun. But, but on Wednesdays, um, 
our, our waitress out there, her name is Miranda, and she just got another job, but she was, she's been our waitress forever, and she was, she was on me to try this pizza that had sausage and sauerkraut on it. And that sounded grody to me. It really did. I'm like, no, nah, I don't know. But she was so persistent. She said, she said you've got to try this. You're going to love it. It rocks the Casbah, you know. And she kept on me and kept on me. And so finally, I just, I just tried it just to appease her, you know, get her off my back. And I found out, it's pretty stinking good. <laughs> it is. And I, I, like, ordered it a whole bunch of times. And it is really good. So, so persistence can be a good thing, you know. In fact, in fact, persistence can be a very good thing. It can. Last, last Sunday... That was my first chance to, to preach in like a month, you know, because of camp and vacations and all this stuff. And I got to tell you, when I sat down to work on, on the message the week before as I was getting ready, man, I, I was struggling so hard to get anything to come out right. I couldn't get the words right. I couldn't get my flow. It, nothing was working. And I had, asked, I had asked several people to pray for me as I was working on my message. And, and I'm assuming that they did. But one of the, the responses that I thought was really really intriguing was from Stan, Stan Storer. Um, Stan was one of the people that I had asked to pray for me, and he said he did, and he said he woke up in the morning and he prayed for me and he thought that was it, but, but then he said, he goes, the Holy Spirit kept tugging on his heart to keep praying and to keep praying and to keep praying, and Stan said that by the time of the day was done, he had stopped what he was doing five different times throughout the day to pray for me as I was working on the message. Isn't that awesome? I, that is, I, thought that, I, that, I just got goosebumps, you know, when I heard that because I truly think that it was Stan's persistence in praying for me that led us to have a message last week. That's so cool. I don't know, I don't know who was praying for me this week, but, you know, thanks. <laughs> you know, God's Word, it tells us to be persistent in lifting people up. In, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 3, it says, Encourage one another daily. Not just once, not just occasionally. Encourage one another daily, every day. Be persistent in this. If you go through and you read Paul's letters in the Bible, over and over and over again, Paul asks people to pray for him. Be persistent about it, he's saying. And he's persistent in asking for prayer. You know, look in, in, in the book of Galatians and in 2 Thessalonians. Two times Paul says that we need to be persistent in doing good for other people. So our persistence, it makes a real difference. It does. And, not, and it's not because we're wearing people down. That's not why it makes a difference. Our persistence makes a difference because it's how we show real care for people. It's how we show concern for people. If we love people, you don't, just, you don't just forget about them when they're going through a tough time. Our love for them is what drives us to care about them and then care about them some more and then care about them some more. We are called to be persistent in lifting people up. Paul, Paul had this passion for seeing people come to know Jesus. He was, he was persistent about this, and he would stop at nothing to see people introduced to, to Jesus' love. He kept at it and kept at it, and the longer that he wrestled with this, the more he wrestled with the depth of God's love and the reality of God's love, the more he began to understand that Jesus' love is the answer to the meaning of life. That life, when you think about life, life is essentially meaningless without, without the love of Christ. And so Paul wrestled with this, and, and Paul believed that nobody should be cut off from the love of God. And so Paul went out and he started churches, and he, he talked to groups of people, and he talked to individuals, and he tried to share with them the love of Christ. But you want to know, know what broke Paul's heart? You know what crushed his spirit? It was the fact that that his own people, the Jewish people, would not embrace Jesus as the Son of God. That broke his heart. That bothered him so much that he said this. He said, my heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. Isn't that amazing? 
That is that powerful. You know, certainly Paul didn't know all those people. He didn't know them all individually. Yet he cared about them so much that he was willing to sacrifice his own salvation if they would come to know Christ. That is, that is a passionate love, isn't it? Have you ever, have you ever felt that? Have you ever felt that, that kind of passionate yearning for someone else's spiritual well-being? Have you ever felt that before? I mean, think about this. Really think. Do you have family members or friends or groups of people that you just, you desperately wish that they knew Jesus? Are there people like that? You know, as believers, we are called to carry a burden for those people. We are. But so often, we, we just don't know how to develop that kind of yearning inside of us. We don't know how to, how to ignite that. And often we don't, know, we don't know how to get those people to connect to Christ's love. And so sometimes we just kind of we shrug our shoulders and we say, you know, it's up to them whether they're going to believe or not believe. And then we just drop it. But that is not what Paul does. That is not what he does. He agonizes over this. He grieves that these people have chosen to disconnect from the heart of God. It bothers him. I mean, where does, where does that kind of passion come from? Where does that love, that deep love for other people's spiritual well-being, where does that come from? How does that originate? How do we develop that kind of care in our lives for other people? How do we develop that? You know, look at, look at what Paul does. When Paul wants to, to introduce others to Christ, the first thing that he does is he identifies with people. The reason that Paul grieves so much for the Jews, the reason that, that he cares so much for them, is that they were his people. He was one of them. He could relate to them. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that Paul cared about other people in their situations too, but he felt especially close to the Jews because he could feel what they were feeling. He understood their way of thinking and he wanted so badly for them to know what he knew. So listen, if you want to develop a love for people who don't know Jesus, it makes sense to start with the people that you know, the people that you already relate to, the people that you can identify with. I mean, we all run in different circles, guys. We do. You know, we, we all associate with different groups of people. And the people that you connect with are people that I cannot reach. The people that I connect with are people that you can't reach. But what if nobody reaches them? What if nobody does? That's what went through Paul's mind. And that's what needs to go through our mind as well. You know, God puts us in our unique situations, in our context, and he surrounds us with those people so that we will reach them. That is kind of our assignment. That is our mission field. Paul's heart yearned for the Jews. Who does your heart yearn for? The first thing that Paul did is he identified with those people. The second thing that Paul does is he prays for them. He prays for them. If you look at one chapter after the one we're looking at today in, in, in Romans 10, this is what Paul says. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. If, if you've got people in your life that don't know the love of God that Jesus brings, the most powerful thing that you can do is to pray. You know, if you've got those people, you know you cannot change their mind for them. You cannot force them into a relationship with their creator. You cannot direct their spiritual lives. So sometimes we just throw up our hands and we think that we're helpless. Don't think for a minute that there's nothing you can do. You can get down on your knees and you can pray just like Paul did. We pray with, we pray with real meaning. We pray with a real confidence in God's power. And we ask God, this is what we ask God, we ask God to soften their hearts. And we ask God to 
to bless them with the knowledge that those blessings come from his hand. We ask God, we ask God to keep knocking. We ask God to heal their doubts. You know, that's what we pray for. Don't misunderstand the purpose of prayer, you guys. Prayer is not a way for us just to kind of throw our hands in the air and say, ah, I can't figure this one out. He's yours, God. That's, that's not what prayer is. Prayer is an offering. It's an offering. As we take those people and gently and lovingly lift them into the presence of Almighty God so that His grace can cover them. That's the purpose of prayer. Take us seriously. If you've got those people in your life that don't know the love of Jesus, the most powerful, loving thing that you can do for them is pray for them. So Paul identifies with people and he, and he prays for them. And the third thing that Paul does in reaching out to the Jews is that he's persistent with them. You look in, in the book of Acts, you'll see that there are three times when Paul takes this missionary journey out to take the love of Jesus out to, to Jews and to non-Jews alike, anyone who's outside of his area, he wants to reach them with the love of Christ. But if you look in the book of Acts, if you look at this, everywhere he goes, the first stop he makes, the first place he goes, is to the Jewish synagogue. He always goes to his Jewish brothers and sisters first because he refuses to give up on them. And the same ought to be true for us. When God puts those people in your life and he surrounds you with those people that you've got, he's counting on you to be ready to sacrifice, to reach out to them, to help them overcome their doubts. And as Paul, Paul was, I mean, Paul was, was, was so filled with passion that he was ready to sacrifice his salvation if others would come to know Christ. Are we ready to sacrifice? Are we ready to reach out and be persistent in sharing God's love with people, people around us, especially introducing them to Jesus. You know, persistence, it looks different ways to different people. You can't, you can't take Paul's pattern and just follow that all the time because that doesn't always work in your context. Being persistent, reaching out to people, inviting people is going to look different to each one of us. And so you've got to find what works for you. All right? There's different ways to do it. I want you to take a look at a, a video that someone sent me this week as a way of thinking about how would we reach out to people. So take a look at this. like every week but would you like to ride the church with me oh uh, come on mrs edwards you'll like my church we have some hot music it may not be what you're bumping at all but it's hot we get down what do you say mrs edwards oh uh, i suppose I've heard it said that 80% of first-time church visitors come because someone personally invited them. All people need to feel loved and wanted, and for some people, it just takes having someone offer to give them a ride to church. We have something great going on at this church. People's lives are being transformed by God's love. Your homework this week is to find at least one person who could use a little more of that love and invite them to come with you next week. Trust me, it's worth the extra effort. Mrs. Edwards, you want to listen to some music on the way? Go ahead, your choice. <sighs> okay, here we are. Isn't that awesome? See, there's, there's not one set formula for reaching out to people. But, but if, you, if you try one time and then give up, you might be missing out on the one week when they were ready to say yes. Be persistent 
in reaching out to people. And if, you don't, if it doesn't work the first time, try something. Listen to their music. Find a way to relate to them and then reach out again. There's, there's, there's no way for us to force care and concern for other people. But the truth is there's so many people out there that desperately need the love of God that Jesus brings. We can't wave a magic wand and make them connect. You can't do that. What you can do is you can relate to them and identify with them. You can pray for them. You can be persistent in reaching out to them and loving them. That's what you can do. Do that and trust that God is going to do the rest. I'm going to invite you to pray with me as our ushers come up to collect our offering this morning. God Almighty, you, you desire us more than anything. You seek to know us and to love us and to hold us. That is, that is your greatest desire. But your second greatest desire is for us to yearn for people the way that you do. So create a passion in us for others. Help us to identify with them and pray for them and be persistent with them as we, as we seek to draw them near to you. Father, receive our offerings and our gifts and our tithes as we give them to you as an act of worship and as an act of commitment. And bless them in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen.